World Series Report 71 with Joe Garagiola and Sandy Koufax. Brought to you by Texaco and the many thousands of Texaco retailers and distributors in all 50 states. Trust Texaco to have the right gasoline for you. What must it be like to be the youngest player in the World Series and then find yourself an instant hero? Well, to find out, Sandy Koufax and Milt May. Sandy? Thank you, Joe. Milt, first of all, congratulations. I'm not going to ask you if that's the biggest hit you've ever got. I'm sure that uh, we both know it probably was. What about the pitch? It looked like the ball wasn't even a strike. Was it high? I believe, uh, looking back on the, on the pitch, I believe it might have been a little high, maybe an, an inch or so. Uh, a reporter told me after the game in the locker room that uh, Earl Weaver said that they were going to try, if I got up, that they were going to you know, try to make me hit a bad pitch and not throw me a, a strike. So I guess their scouting reports is that I um, swing a little freely up there, maybe a few bad pitches, and he's, he's probably right. It's got to be a tough job being the second string catcher behind a fellow like Manny Sanguian. Uh, Manny, last winter, they tried to blame him in the outfield in winter ball, but I understand he ran into a wall, got hit by a line drive. Can you play any place else? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I think Manny's the best catcher in the major leagues right now. Uh, there aren't too many or never have been too many that hit over 300 consistently like he does. As far as me playing another position, I don't, I don't believe so. I'm, one of the main assets that I have going for me is the fact that I am a left-handed hitting catcher, and I think that I just have to prove that I can play and do well enough to force a move to be made somehow. Well, Milt, good luck to you. Maybe we'll see you behind the plate one of these days for the Pirates. Let's go back to New York and Joe Garagiola. Bruce Keeson is a 21-year-old from Pasco, Washington, who woke up this morning and found out that he owned the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And here he is in slow motion, sidearm delivery. Reminds you a bit of Ewell Blackwell. Gives you a lot of elbows, fingernails, kneecaps, and a good fastball. He broke some Baltimore hearts last night with that good fastball that you just saw, and it's lucky that that's all he broke. Cause he got Davy Johnson once. Frank Robinson. And then Andy Etcheberry is going to find it a little tough to sit down this morning. Even on the bases, young Keeson was very aggressive. He gets Dave Johnson again. Watch what he does. He gets the wrong cap. When Bruce Keeson came to the park this morning, you know what he had in his back pocket? He had the city of Pittsburgh right there. He also had a day with Sandy Koufax. Hey, Sandy, does he change his clothes in the telephone booth and leap tall buildings in a single bound? I'm sure that the Orioles think he can this morning. Bruce, an incredible performance last night. Uh, a lot of people said you were nervous in the first game in Baltimore that you were in. Uh, didn't look like it last night. Well, over in Baltimore, I had a little trouble getting a ball over the plate. I, I couldn't find the plate, and uh, I got behind the hitters, and they were just taken. I threw nine pitches, and eight of them were balls, and I was very displeased with my performance. And uh, last night, I'd, I knew I had to come in the game and throw strikes and get the ball over the plate, and luckily, that's what I did. He hit three batters last night. Uh, somebody might accuse you of throwing at the hitters. Uh, it looked to me like a couple of them were breaking balls. Right, they were very poorly thrown pitches. They All they did was spin up there, and they were very bad pitches, and they were supposed to be in the outside of the plate. All I did was spun. I'm just thankful they didn't hang over the middle of the plate where they could get some, uh, get the bat on the ball. I know that the right-handers are going to have a lot of trouble staying in there, hitting against you. What about left-handers? Uh, is there a possibility that you might have a little trouble with them? The Orioles have a few great ones. One of them, Boog Powell, in the ninth inning last night, proved to everybody just how strong he was. Uh, you get a chance to look at it. You see Boog break that bat with one hand. And uh, I know from experience, I've been mad once or twice, tried it. It's not easy to do. Do the left-handers give you a problem? In the past, left-handers, uh, if anybody's going to give me any trouble, a left-hander usually would, because I uh, used to throw a real flat curve, and now I throw more or less a, a slider, or a, a combination between a curve and a slider. And uh, that's helped me. I have to be real, more careful with the left-hander than I am a right-hander. I've come up with a change-up, and that's been real effective for me on a left-handed better. So overall, I've improved on 
know how I can handle a left-hander better, but like I say, if anybody's going to give me any trouble, a left-hander will. Well, last night, I don't think anybody would would have given you any trouble. Congratulations. Good luck to you. Let's go back to New York and Joe Garagiola. Okay, Sandy. Say, if you're 37 years old with a complete set of aches and pains, baseball should be pretty tough for you, right? Wrong. You stick around, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. On yesterday's show, we gave you a chance to be an umpire, and today we're going to give you a chance to be a scout. I want you to watch a particular hitter, and then you would have to report back on how the defense should play him or how a pitcher should uh, pitch to him. This hitter's name, though, Roberto Clemente. Going to be a good job for you. First thing you'd write down, be a right-handed batter, and he hits it down the right field line, just barely foul. That's the one that hit the pole. So you might say play him that way because he hits to right field. See what happens. Okay, he does hit the right field. He gets a base hit on this one. Here he is again now. Whoops, hit this one through the middle. So now you got one in right field and one up the middle. And uh, would you bunch him? No, because he's got good eye and he can walk. Can he run? And run fast enough to beat it out. You know, when you work on a guy like that, you try to move the ball around. Watch this piece of film because we combined it. Keep your eye on the catcher, how he constantly moves to get Clemente out. He's outside this time. Keep your eye on Etchebarren. Remember, it was outside. There he goes again, outside corner. Now he's way in. The cliche, I guess, says pitch low and behind him. There he goes, way in. Way out. If you get it too good, he's going to hit it. You've got to constantly move that ball around. I know when they talked about him in the clubhouse, they used to say things like, if he had one foot off the ground, it'd be a single. Both feet off the ground, it'd be an extra base hit. Best description I ever heard, Mr. George Sisler used it. He said that Clemente was a good, bad ball hitter, but he would be a better, good ball hitter. But if he lost his aggressiveness, then the cure would be worse than a disease. Some kind of hitter, Mr. Clemente. Best way to pitch him, I guess, is to throw a fastball and then... Fan out, man. Fan out, because he's going to hit it somewhere. Thank you. Hey, Sandy, it's time for our fantastic picks. But before we do, I, I want to ask you about the city of Pittsburgh, not so much the ball club. What, what is the feeling there? What's the attitude? Are they really souped up? Joe, I think both the people and the weather is a lot brighter here in Pittsburgh today than it were two days ago. Now, let's make these fantastic picks. I'm going to go with the Baltimore catcher, Hendricks, as my star of the game. If you're going to stick with the catchers, I think I'll have to stick with the pitchers. And uh, as long as it's a left-hander and Dave McNally, I've got to go with McNally. And uh, after seeing him a few times, how could you ever bet against him? Okay, you got McNally, I got Hendricks, and it's time for game number five. And Sandy and I will see you before game number six from Baltimore. Hey, Sandy, is it hot living in that little square? <laughs> and now stay tuned following station identification for game number five of the 1971 World Series. I feel that uh, after four games, uh, being two and two with the Pirates and uh, McNally and Jim Palmer, the two pitchers that have beaten them coming up in order, that uh, if we can contain Clemente, who's just been outstanding throughout the series, there might not be a ball game Sunday. Well, I've been asked about the Pirates' chances for uh, winning the series. You take our ball club that has been a decided uh, underdog since the series winners were announced, and now uh, we lose the first two ball games in Baltimore and bounce back and take the next two. And now for the sixth and seventh game, if we need them, uh, I have a young fellow named Bobby Moose and Steve Blass cranking up. And I say uh, we got a good a chance than anybody because it's a two out of three game series, and I got three uh, pretty good chuckers going for me. And as you've heard, 
Each manager highly confident. As NBC Sports, a service of NBC News presents Game 5 of the 1971 World Series. The American League champions, the Baltimore Orioles, versus the National League champions, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Brought to you by the dry look. The wet head is dead. Long live the dry look. By Philip 66, the performance company. At Philip 66, it's performance that counts. And by Chrysler Corporation. Extra care in engineering. Your host today, your local Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Hi, everybody. Kurt Gowdy of NBC Sports. Bob Prince, the broadcaster of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And down in the stands again, my partner on NBC's Game of the Week, Mr. Tony Kupak. And two 21-year-old rookies and a 37-year-old veteran are the toast of Pittsburgh. But it's a new game, and we'll probably have some new heroes. That's the way the series has progressed day by day. The Pirates are even now. This will be the last game in Pittsburgh. We have a traveling date tomorrow, and then we'll move into Baltimore Saturday and Sunday if needed. Now let's take a look at the starting pitchers of today's game. And Dave McNally is going to be on the mound for the Orioles. He won the opening game 5-3 to three with nine strikeouts, a 21-game winner. And he has been a blue chipper in World Series competition. He has an earned run average under two in all the World Series he's pitched in. He's going to be opposed by a right-hander, Nelson Bryles, who pitched well late in the season for the Pirates, winning eight and losing four. Bryles uh, had some difficulty with uh, a pulled leg muscle in the playoffs, and uh, he says, though, he's completely healed now. And I heard that statement, Bob Prince, that Danny Murtaugh made, said it's now two out of three for the World Series championship, and that he has three outstanding pitchers ready to go. Is Bryles one of those? Well, Bryles would have to be one of them, Kurt, no question about that. Then if the Pirates could uh, win today, he could then go with Johnson on Saturday and come back with Blass if necessary, or the reverse of that, if Baltimore takes the lead, come right back with Blass on Saturday. So he has his three pitchers ready to go. You know, there's one thing about Danny Murtaugh. He makes remarkable moves, and for no apparent reason, he'll switch off on certain players, and uh, he doesn't worry at all about the second guess. And one good thing about him, if a player for him has a bad performance, such as Johnson had in the championship series, he came right back with him and got the clincher. And then the other day in game two in Baltimore, he brought in young Bruce Keeson, 21 years of age. He walked the bases full, then threw another base on balls up there, walked in a run, and he was out of the ball game. And then came right back with him last night. Picked up a magnificent six in the third innings of pitching out of Keeson, allowing one hit, issuing no odds. And now, let's go down on the field to Tony Kubek. Thank you. With me on the field, the guy they're saying is having an awful World Series as far as everything I've read and heard, Willie Stars. And Willie, I checked the first four-game box scores. You've been on base nine times with walks and hits in the first four games. Is that a bad series? Well, not as far as I'm concerned, Tony. Uh, the fact that I'm here in a World Series, something I've always dreamed of is, uh, as long as I can recall. And now that I'm uh, relaxed at the plate, I, I, I didn't do a thing in the playoffs. And, but we won, and that was the main thing. And now we're here, and we're doing some of the things that we feel that our club is capable of doing. And personally, uh, uh, like you say, I've been on base, and I would like to uh, produce in some of the key situations, but uh, hitting is either you do or you don't. And our team is, when someone doesn't do it, someone picks us up. And I just look forward to an exciting series, and hopefully I can perform a little more better. Willie, you were uh, talking to me yesterday about some of the encouragement some of the fans around the country with letters and cards and everything else. This is true, and I've been getting a lot of uh, well-wishing from uh, various people from around the country, and I'd like to take this time to thank everyone for their concern. Uh, I'm not going to give up on myself. I, I never will, and I'd like to thank the people for their concern and pulling for me because uh, it just indicates that there's a lot of fine people in the world. Willie Stargell, thanks so much. Good luck. Thank you, Tony. It's the day after the night before, and Nellie Bryles becomes the newest inspiration of Danny Murtaugh's rocking chair genius. Bryles, who hasn't pitched in two weeks, and very little then. Game five just about to get underway, and today's umpires at home plate, Jim Odom. At first base, John Kibler. At second base, Nestor Shylock. At third base, Ed Sudol. In left field, John Rice. And in right field, Ed Bargo. 
The Pirates will be taking the field momentarily and will break from their dugout on the first base side. It is 340 down both lines here. 385 right center left center and 410 straight away. And as Kurt Gowdy has told you it is a perfectly magnificent day for this fifth game which of course means so much to both ball clubs. And this will be the last game played here in the 1971 series as the Orioles and the Pirates will now journey them to Baltimore and the Pirates now take the field. Now defensively for Pittsburgh in left field Wilbur Stargell. Manager Murtaugh has gone to Gene Kleins in center with McNally pitching. In right field Roberto Clemente. They switch at third back to Jose Pagan. Jackie Hernandez will play short. Dave Cash at second base. Bobby Robertson at first base. Behind the plate Manny Sanguin. And on the mound Nelson Browles on the year had a record of eight and four. So game five is set to go here. And the crowd still continuing to file in as Don Buford will be set to step in and as you watch Nelson Browse here in slow motion on his warm ups basically comes over the top has a palm ball slider and a curve and occasionally will throw the sinker here to carry on in the broadcast the voice of NBC Sports Kirk Gowdy. Thank you Bob Prince. Don Buford Paul Blair Boog Powell are going to be the first three batters up. Buford in the series has two hits in 13 times. He had a home run in Baltimore. He's knocked in two runs. A 290 batter for the season. Here's our first pitch of game five, and it's foul back. Nelson Bryles, 28 years old, lives in St. Louis, born in Doris, California. A 1 1 delivery. A high pop. Hernandez, the shortstop, calling for it. One down. Paul Blair has had three hits and five times up. Blair hit 262 on the year. 10 homers, 44 runs batted in. 0 oh and 2. That's in there. Looks like Blair was waiting for the curve again, and he pumped the fastball right through. Two down. Boog Powell has had only one hit in 15 times. Two fifty six. Seasonal hitter with 22 homers, 92 runs batted in. Gets it to the box. And there is an easy one, two, three inning for Nelson Brown. So in the middle of the first, the score, Baltimore nothing, and the Pirates coming to bat. And here's the way the Orioles line up defensively. Buford's in left. Blair's in center. Frank Robinson in right. Brooks Robinson at third. Mark Belanger at short. Second baseman will be Dave Johnson. Luke Powell at first. The catcher is Ellie Hendricks. And Dave McNally. The starting pitcher today for the Orioles. Dave McNally, as you study him, had maybe his best fastball of the season in the opening game of the World Series when he struck out his seasonal high nine. Instead of starting him last night they wanted him to have another day's rest to keep that good fastball he had. And the fastball is outside one and nothing to Dave Cash who's had three hits in 17 times. The three one delivery and he walks Dave Cash. The 
Nelly lost the second game of the 69 series to the Mets two to one. He pitched a complete game was beaten by Kuzman and he won the third game of the World Series last year. A complete game victory nine to three. One stretch of the first game against the Pirates McNally retired 19 in a row. So he walks the first batter here today. There it is hit to the box. McNally goes to Belanger for one. Belanger on safe at first. Dean Klein, the fastest runner in the fired ball club, beat the throw to first. You'll see a little bit of an off balance throw here as uh, McNally had to come up with it. And there you saw the toss to the third base side of second. And that just took away the opportunity to get Mr. Klein. Right now, here has been the outstanding player of the series, Roberto Clemente. Clemente has eight hits and 17 times up for an average of 471. The only player who's hit safely in every game of the series. And he's hit safely now in every World Series game he's played in, in the 1960 series and the 1971 series. Field, Frank Robinson going back, back, and has it right up against the wall. Clemente nearly reached the wall in right field with that one. Very fine play by Robinson running off to the left there, as you see, just about running out of track. A little bit of a breeze blowing out toward left. But Robinson made a remarkable play there, Kurt. He certainly did as Willie Stargell steps in with two down now. Gene Klein's at first and no score. They have a big banner hung up there in the facade in the upper tier in right field. Ball one, Stargellville, a long way from home. And he's hit a couple of shots up there. There it is. And number one is the first one he hit in this park, and the first player to hit one in that upper tier. Dave McNally. A lot of folks in Montana interested in this World Series game today. Dave was born in Billings. There goes the runner. It's a swing and a miss. Hendricks throw is not in time. And the Pirates are running on the Baltimore catches. You'll see this time, McNally really comes with a good pitch that Stodgill misses. And a little bit of a problem there as Hendricks had to take that ball down low. And Kleins with great speed. Watch him dig now and uh, running straight in there in a quick look to see which way the throw's coming. And he determines he can go straight in. There's a bounding ball to shortstop Belanger. And that's it. As the Pirates are out in the last of the first inning. They had no runs, no hits, there were no errors, and one man left. At the end of the first inning, it's the Orioles nothing and the Pirates nothing. Billy Hunter coaching at third for the Orioles. George Stoller at first. Nelson Bryles is the fifth starting pitcher in this World Series for the Pirates. The last time that a World Series team used five different starters in the first five games was back in 1955 when the Dodgers in six games actually used six starters. They had Newcomb, Billy Lowe, Johnny Padres, Carl Erskine, Roger Craig, Carl Spooner. Padres started the seventh game and won. Frank Robinson. And there's trouble. That one blooping down. Going back is Bob Robinson to take it. And foul down. One away. Telecast presented by authority of Major League Baseball, intended solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the expressed written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Ellie Hendricks, hitting in the number five spot for the Orioles, has had three hits in ten times. No score in this game. A fly ball out to center fielder Gene Klein. Puts it away for the second out. Nelson Browse now has set down the first five men. This is not Nelson Bryles' first World Series appearance. He pitched in four games and had three starts for the Cardinals in the 1967-68 series. 67 when the Cardinals played the Red Sox and 68 when they went against the Tigers. 
Brooks Robinson. Robinson lines it in the center. A solid base hit. Grabbed on a hop by Gene Kleins. And Brooks Robinson has his sixth World Series hit. First hit of this game, Dave Johnson. Three hits in 15 times, an average of 200. Lofts a high fly in the left center. The shortstop Hernandez out, center fielder Klein coming in. And Klein got out of the way wisely. It's always easier for that man coming on to make the grab. No runs for the Orioles. One hit, there were no errors, and one left. We've got an inning and a half with the score. Baltimore nothing and Pittsburgh nothing. Frank Oshiak coaching at third for Pittsburgh. Don Leppard at first. Bob Robertson starts it off for the Pirates in the last of the second. Robertson two hits in 14 times. One of those hits a three run homer. There's a long blast in the deep center. That one is way back, and it is gone. get the sweet end of the bat right on it striding forward with those very powerful legs and brings it right in there and he just gets right on the money with this one drives it almost dead center field and Blair who does play a very shallow center field to begin with just had a little longer run to go back and watch it drop in there as Danny Murtaugh very casually and I guess Kurt enjoys a one nothing lead. Yes, and a banner or something has dropped off now in left center, and the time is called while they pick it up. Bob Robertson, a native of the state of Maryland, was a shot putter in high school and threw the shot over 50 feet. Strong boy who now has hit six home runs in postseason play, had four homers in the playoffs, three in one game against the Giants, and he's now had two World Series home runs. So the Pirates lead one to nothing, last of the second. Manny Sanguian, five hits in 17 times, hitting 294 in this series. A ball to Sanguian. Sanguian got off to a slow start in the series, but the last two games he's been on base. McNally, Way out of the strike zone, two and nothing, and Hendricks decides you better have a chat with him. Jim Palmer will go for sure for the Orioles. There's a base hit by Stan Gee in the center. And Guillen had uh, two hits last night, had a couple of hits here in game three. He's starting to warm up with that bat. Jose Pagan has had two hits in eight times in this series. And Guillen on first. And now they're keeping him close. Pitch out. And Guillen stole the base last night. All right, let's see if they start him now. Three and two count. There he goes. And it's strike three. Hendrick throw. And he's safe. And Gian has stolen second. And the Pirates have stolen four bases the last two games. All right, watch San Gian now as he digs. This is a low throw coming in. And uh, Johnson was the man covering on the play. Now you can watch him all alone here as he comes in. The bang bang play right there at second. But his foot is in there and the tag is up on the knee. They catch your Sanguia now has stolen two bases in the series. Jackie Hernandez up. Sanguia on second one down. Pirates ahead one to nothing. A strike to Hernandez. 
Curve is over. Strike two. Nothing and two. Struck him out on a bad pitch. Two down. And Bryles, the fire pitcher, coming up. Not a bad hitter for a pitcher. Lifetime National League batting average of 144. Hit a couple of career home runs, both at Philadelphia. San Guillen's at second, two down. Pittsburgh leading one to nothing last of the second. Curved him for a strike. Strike two in the curve. Foul ball. One ball, two strike pitch. Hendricks said he swung. Umpire Odom says no. Two and two. Center around third is Sanguin. He scores, and the Pirates lead two to nothing. Right off the end of the bat, a little bit of a dunker, and even though Blair was playing shallow, no chance at all. And Sanguin, as you see, sliding to make certain he gets in there to make it two nothing Pittsburgh. Fire scored all their runs last night after two out and here are two outs today and Brile single after Robertson let off with a home run in this inning. And McNally had Bryles two strikes and then lost him. The so Bryles is on first two away and Dave cashed the batter. He walked his first time. A curve for a strike. Well the Pirates now have had three hits as many as they got in the entire first game against Dave McNally over at Baltimore. The 0 1 pitch is hit to Brooks Robinson, who gloves it over to Johnson, and that's it. Force out on Biles. But the Pirate fans give him a hand. Two runs, three hits, no errors, one left. At the end of two innings in Pittsburgh, the Pirates two, the Orioles nothing. Sunday, we'll either have game seven of the World Series, followed by NFL football, Cleveland at Cincinnati, or San Diego at Denver. Or if the World Series is over on Saturday, there'll be an NFL football doubleheader. The early games will be Baltimore against the Giants in New York, Buffalo against the Jets in New York, New England playing at Miami. And then if it's an all-football doubleheader, the second game will be Cleveland at Cincinnati or San Diego at Denver. Either way, a big sports doubleheader on NBC Sunday afternoon. And remember, game six of the World Series, Saturday. Mark Belanger. Belanger, as the French call him up in the western part of Massachusetts. Three hits and 14 times in this series with an average of 214. Nelson Bryles. There's a fly ball in the right field. Clemente drawing a beat on it, puts it away. One out for the Orioles in the top of the third. Dave McNally has hit two World Series homers. Shares the World Series record for home runs by a pitcher with Bob Gibson. He pops it up. The second baseman of the Pirates, Dave Cash. Handles it for out number two. Now the top of the order, switch hitting Don Buford. He popped up his first time. 3-2 pitch. Pagan picks it up. Throws him out. And another 1-2-3 two, inning for Nelson Bryant. At the end of two and a half innings in Pittsburgh, our score is the Pirates 2 and the Orioles nothing. Gene Kleins, Roberto Clemente, and Willie Stargell facing Dave McNally in the last of the third. And McNally missing again with that fastball. Three and one. Getting his curve over better than he has his fastball, Bob. 
No question about that, and the Pirates perhaps have noticed that and uh, are laying off that fastball and waiting to try to hit a curveball strike. It was a fastball that McNally was getting most of his strike cuts on in Baltimore. 3 1 pitch. Walk Dean Klein. George Carlin, Sugar Ray Robinson, Pat Boone, and special guest Herbie, the Good Time Ice Cream Man, are Flip's guests on the Flip Wilson Show tonight, right here on NBC. Every time you're high, you're letting your body get way out there. You know, maybe you got to concentrate on shorting your stride. So hang your body up, hold, hold it just a second, and then come down. Okay? You got no pain, have you? No. Okay, come on now. Fastball looks good if you start getting it down. The Pirates, a non-walking team. They don't walk too much. They've received 22 walks from a pitching staff, which normally has excellent control. Roberto Clemente hit a long drive to right field that Frank Robinson grabbed right in front of the right field wall in the first inning. In our tease that we opened today's show with, you heard the Oriole manager Earl Weaver said, we've got to contain Clemente if we're going to win this series. One, two pitch. There goes the runner. Pounding ball to short. Belangero have to hurry. It's there in time. Clemente puts the heat on that defense. The Pirates, Kurt, have always been a firm believer since the days of Dick Grode of hitting and running on a one ball, two strike count. And Clemente, of course, there getting some piece of the ball and no play, as you saw, anywhere but at first. Dean Klein's now at second, one away. Willie Stargell will grounded a short his first time. McNally's 1 1 pitch. A high fly ball out to Buford and left. He has room. Kleins is tagging at second and is not coming. The throw comes into Belanger. Two down. Gene Kleins at second. Bob Robertson getting a hand. He hammered a home run in the second inning. You know, Kurt, uh, earlier you showed where Stodgill hit one up on the facade in uh, right field to have a similar mark. Or the fourth time a ball been handled there in left field where Bobby Robertson hit one. He's the only man to do that in the left field side. There it is. Boy, that's a real shot, isn't it? As we uh, drop back with our camera, you can see just how high that is out there. Hit down to Brooks Robinson. Makes the throw. And an unusual sight. Brooks Robinson bobbling a ball hit right at him. And he couldn't find a handle to recover. They're safe at first and third. And Robinson is charged with an error. The Orioles now have made nine errors in this series. The Pirates have made just one. And that's the last place where you would expect Baltimore to spring a leak. Here it is again. It was a hard hit ball coming off that turf and it ran up uh, Brooks's arm and then as you see there he just couldn't find the handle and the throw is going to pull Boog Powell off the bag. Otherwise he still might have gotten Bobby Robertson who's not that fast a runner. That puts Robinson's second error in the series. Runners on first and third. Long smash that is foul. Ooh. Boy, he tied into that one. He doesn't hit many home runs during a year. He hit uh, seven. When Sanguian hits the ball, it's usually vicious line drives or sharp blows back to the box. Gets away. Coming in the score is flying. Down the second is Robertson. A breaking pitch in the dirt that bounced almost up on top of the screen behind the plate. And the Pirates lead three to nothing. It has been scored a wild pitch against Dave McNally. Robertson at second. The 2 2 pitch, strike three, Sanguian is caught looking. In the last of the third, one run for Pittsburgh, no hits. One Baltimore error, a costly one, one man left. At the end of three, Pittsburgh three, Baltimore nothing. 
Fourth inning. Paul Blair, Boog Powell, Frank Robinson. Three runs, three hits, no errors for the Pirates. No runs, one hit, one error for Baltimore. Blair struck out his first time. And he hits a high, lazy fly in the right field. There's Clemente. And there's one down. Boog Powell. Bounce to the pitcher his first time. Normally throughout the season, like Willie Mays, Clemente would not play in a day game following a night game due to his age. I rather imagine he didn't even bother to look at the starting lineup card today. Line drive cut by the second baseman, Dave Cash. And the Pirates now are doing everything right and the Orioles everything wrong. Here's a fine timed leap by Dave Cash. He could have gone up prematurely on that one, but just timed it beautifully, as you see right there. And you're right, Kurt. So far, nothing has gone right for the Orioles, and it's about a turnaround of what happened uh, the other way with the Pirates in Baltimore. Frank Robinson fouled out his first time. One ball, one strike. Fouls it back. Struck him out and he fell down. He does that for no reason. He can't explain it himself. Sometimes he just collapses after a pitch. Mickey Stanley starts it off with the Tigers in the last of the fourth inning. Ball one and Bryles fell down. That's an unusual sign. Very rarely see a pitcher fall flat on his face like that. Three up, three down. At the end of three and a half innings, Pittsburgh three and Baltimore nothing. Jose Pagan struck out his first time. Dave McNally's pitch. Line drive to left. Buford plays it on a hop. Fires in. Fourth hit for Pittsburgh. I think as we saw there, Kurt, Buford played that ball just a little peculiarly. He's alert to the fact that a ball hitting in front of him can bounce over his head, and he just might have been a little wary on that one. A three and two count to Hernandez. Pagan at first, nobody out. There goes Pagan, and there's a base hit in the center. Pagan rounding second. Here's a throw from Paul Blair. Right on the button, he's out at third. Pagan running on a pitch is thrown out and a perfect throw by Paul Blair to Brooks Robinson. I think we'll see if it's on our picture here as the ball goes between his legs. Pagan uh, slows up going into second and that loss of momentum there was just no contest. Look what I got waiting for you. Now watch Pagan as he comes around second. He slowed up a little teeny bit. Then he just started to look like he was running out of gas and that's not the slow motion. He just ran out of petrol. That's all there was with that. Now Pagan still gets a hand from the partisan pirate fans as he goes into their dugout. Hernandez is on first. Two solid hits off Dave McNally here for the Pirates in the last of the fourth. Ryle single to drive in a run in the second. And he bunts. It's a fair ball. The throw goes to Dave Johnson, the second baseman, covering it first from the catcher, Ellie Hendricks. The sacrifice for Bryles. Hernandez now in scoring position at second. Top of the order in Dave Cash, who walked and bounced into a force play. Pittsburgh ahead, three to nothing. Nally pitching one and one to Cash. Hits a ground ball to short. A long throw here by Belanger from the hole. It's in time. Fine pickup by Boog Powell at first. That's the throw they rate shortstops on from the hole. No runs. Two hits for Pittsburgh. There were no errors. They left one. At the end of four innings, the score Pittsburgh three, Baltimore nothing. You now we've shown you the coaches here at first and third throughout the series. I think we should mention the other coaches that perhaps you haven't seen on camera. George Bamberger, of course, is in the hospital uh, over in Baltimore recovering from a heart attack. He's been the pitching coach of the Orioles. And the other Oriole coach is Jim Fry for Pittsburgh. 
Now and then you've seen Bill Burden uh, seated alongside Murtaugh in the Pirate dugout. Dan Osborne is the pitching coach of the Pirates, and Dave Ricketts is the other Pirate coach. Ellie Hendricks in the fifth inning for the Orioles, followed by Brooks Robinson and Dave Johnson. Three to nothing, Pittsburgh. Hendricks is on the first walk issued by Bryles. And the man that has the only hit off Bryles is Brooks Robinson, who's standing in. He's single to center in the second inning. There's a ground ball to Hernandez. Force there. Cash on. Double play. Hendricks tried to take him out. Boy, I'll tell you one thing. Hernandez really made a fine play in the hole over here on the off-balance snap throw. And then Cash coming across that bag just did bail out. And if anybody got injured a teeny bit there, Hendricks, he's limping a little bit. Now watch this play as Hendricks is coming in here trying to uh, get Cash who's pivoting away from him. Wonder if he stepped on his left hand because Hendricks uh, came in. There's a fly ball down the left field line by Dave Johnson. Willie Stargill says, I've got it, and he does. And the Orioles are out in the fifth. No runs, no hits, there were no errors, and nobody left. We've gone halfway, and the score, Pittsburgh three, Baltimore nothing. Now we're coming to the Pirate half the fifth inning with Gene Kleins, Roberto Clemente, and Willie Stargell. Dave McNally against Nelson Bryles. Ellie Hendricks appears to be all right now. He's coming in back of the plate. He was... Uh, Flexing his left hand uh, when he came in after that collision at second base. But now for the play by play, the voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Bob Prince. Thank you very much, Kurt Gotti, and hello again, everybody. Gene Kleins reached base safely both times in the first inning on a force play, walked in the third. Ball one, scored in that third inning, and came in on a wild pitch. On deck, Roberto Clemente. And it's hit deep to left center field, and Blair's going to have to really hustle for this one. That's extra bases. He's going to try for three. They don't even make the throw. Belanger hesitated in getting rid of that ball. Might have had a play on him. We'll never know. Paul Blair, who plays a very shallow center field, and Clemente is now coming up. Lions hit that ball a long way, right on the warning pad. Now watch the ball come into Belanger. And he seems undecided whether to go on the third with it. Well, we don't get him in that shot, and that's Lions hitting the dirt. Now the Pirates now have a runner on third, no out, and the Orioles now have to pull the infield in with Clemente up. Bobby Clemente, who has hit safely in every World Series game in which he has participated, Seven in 1960 and four thus far is looking for his first hit. He lined deep to right field and he grounded out to short. And back to the middle, a gone in infield, past him a run. From any wasting no time, right back through the middle on the drawn in infield. That's his ninth hit in 19 or 20 at bats. And he has now hit safely Kurt Gowdy in every World Series game as Earl Weaver comes out to the mound. And the Pirates have stung McNally today. Three hits in the second. Two base hits in the fourth. A triple and a single here in the fifth. They have been more aggressive at the plate here in Pittsburgh than the Orioles. And Earl Weaver's now decided that he's going to make a pitching change. So the Pirates knock. Dave McNally out. Dave Leonard will be coming in. And while we have a break in the action here at Pittsburgh, the score now is Pittsburgh four and Baltimore nothing. Now Dave Leonard will face Willie Stargell. Leonard was uh, 
two and three in 1971 season here with Baltimore. An ERA at 2.83. Pop up on the third base side to Brooks Robinson. And there's one out. There's activity again in the Oriole bullpen. Here's Bobby Robertson who hit a home run in the second inning. Now normally Danny Murtaugh does not have his runner going with Robertson up there for obvious reasons. Ball four and Clemente was not going. Now that for the Orioles is their third walk. Clemente at second is the responsibility of the departed pitcher Dave McNally. And now Manny Sanguin, who singled and stole the base back in the second inning and then scored a run and then struck out in the third, stands in. The Pirates have had at least one man on base now, 11 innings in a row. A pop up off the first base side, and if it stays in foul territory, it will. No infield fly rule, so it's two down. Boog Powell making that grab. Now Jose Pagan, who struck out and singled a left in the fourth. Now remember, as Kurt told you earlier, the Pirates throughout this season have been a very fine two-out scoring ball club. They've already shown that. Here, scoring one of their two runs in the second inning with two out and scoring another one in the third with two out. They lead four nothing here in the bottom of the fifth. That's popped into shallow center back Belanger and up Paul Blair and it'll be Paul Blair for the out. So the Pirates score in the fifth inning one run on two hits no errors and strand a pair at the end of five innings Pittsburgh four and Baltimore nothing. And Nellie Bryles becomes the newest inspiration of Danny Murtaugh's rocking chair genius. Bryles, who hasn't pitched in two weeks, and very little then. But except for this single by Brooks Robinson in the second, and another by Boog Powell in the seventh, and walks to Hendricks in the fifth, and Buford in the ninth, Baltimore manager Earl Weaver wonders where all his big hitters went. Dave McNally, who finished strong the first time around, can't avoid trouble, and in the second, Robertson's blast is all the Pirates need. His second home run, his sixth in postseason play. Before the inning ends, Pittsburgh makes it 2 0. San Guillen. Let him steal, Don. Let him hit. Let him hit. And with two out, Miles helps himself, bringing home the fastest catcher around. So in the third, McNally keeps it down to Bob Robertson. And even if Brooks Robinson shows he's only human, Kleins, on with a walk, gets the third on the air. And this low in the San Guillen becomes a run scoring wild pitch. Pittsburgh ahead, 3 0. Were they that good? Or were we just that bad? In the fifth, Gene Kleins leads off. Now Clemente's turn. And he keeps the scoring and his own streak going, punching a curve under McNally's glove in the center. Four to nothing, Pittsburgh. With Bryles in complete command, even pitching on his face, the Orioles go quietly. And the complete turnaround seems to unbalance their poise. And at no time is this more in evidence than when Jose Pagan pops up. And look who goes down.
The last out, and with it, a sweep in Three River Stadium. The Pirates taking the World Series lead, holding the Birds to nine hits in 27 innings, showing the kind of pitching and defense that Baltimore is endowed with, but has not unveiled so far. <laughs> 